Hello, everyone. How are you guys doing this evening? It's such a nice night. I hope everyone wasn't stuck in too much traffic. <laughs> um, thank you all so much for being here um, during Living Art Boston and this amazing panel with our industry experts. Um, so I'm Tanisha Camillo Sheffy, founder and director of Made Incubator. My firm has been spearheading efforts with the city of Boston to really reinvent Boston as a center for creative economy, art and culture and fashion, really to keep creative talent in Boston and drive our economic growth for our city and small businesses. So Made Incubator and partners are kicking off this event and we kicked it off on March 1st and all the way through tomorrow, Actually, which is our finale fashion show, um, but we'll continue to really build these pockets and seeds of growth for our city as a whole. And so we have featured and continued to feature the brightest minds in the industry that come together to, together to understand both challenges and opportunities impacting the creative industry's landscape. Living Art Boston will create an expansive movement providing access, opportunity, resources, and education to small businesses, entrepreneurs, and leaders that support entrepreneurial economics and fashion and business. So I want to thank you to City Awake sponsors, ARUP and Jack Morton for sponsoring this event. Also Eastern Bank, the City of Boston, and all of the amazing, amazing sponsors that have made this Living Art Boston movement and week happen. And it's just been incredible. Um, Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce and City Awake, the Chamber's Young Professional Platform. And I also want to thank our small businesses that have really been a part of our gift bags and all the amazing movement that we've had throughout this whole series. We've had such amazing small businesses and beauty brands and PR people and just it's just been so incredible. So I just welcome you all and thank you and enjoy the conversation. Don't be shy when it comes to Q&A. I can talk a lot. I'm going to I'm going to pass it over to them soon, I promise. But I just want to thank you all for being here and I'm going to introduce Lisa Pierpont and she's going to do our welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tanisha. I met Tanisha in 2018, and it has been so inspiring to see your company grow and see what you, how you have evolved this. It's just absolutely extraordinary. And wait till you hear this panel. Um, we were shooting the breeze in the green room, and I don't even. Th I was like, let's not go out. Let's just talk to each other all night. It was so. There's such interesting people. Their expertise runs so deeply, and it's fantastic. Every single one. Um, so again, my name is Lisa Pierpont. I am a broadcast journalism professor at Emerson, former journalist, editor in chief at Modern Luxury Chronicle on Channel Five, and then I started my old company, uh, my own company called Bold Facers. So. Um, but my father was a fashion designer, so I never really went too far from the fashion world. Um, okay, so uh, let it talk, let's talk about our folks that you are gonna be here from. First up, we have our moderator, Raina Jacques, who also was a huge fashion person, <laughs> even though you're a very, very impressive lawyer. She is an associate attorney at Sunstein LLP, concentrating in trademark litigation. She is dedicated to developing brand protection strategies for clients, from trademark clearance and registration to litigating infringement issues. And she also is a really snazzy dresser, as you can see. Um, we have Evan Crothers, Evan is the art director for all on-model on model editorial fashion for the luxury off-price sites of Gilt and Rue La La, tasked with, the, with leading a team of photographers, models, stylists, hair, makeup, multiple shoots every week. He truly believes in the power of collaboration. He is also sort of a former aspiring Broadway star. I just have to say that as well. Next, we have Nandy Howard, who came to us straight from the airport from... Texas, the content director at Essence Magazine, who leads print and digital content creation. Recently, she was the EIC, that's editor-in-chief, for those in the know, of Houstonia Magazine, Houston's leading lifestyle publication. And our final speaker is Ariel Foxman, general manager of Boston Seaport for WS Development. He is named one of Crane's New York businesses, 40 under 40, and one of 
Business of Fashions, BOF500. You may have to define what that means, um, among other accomplishments. Accomplishments, and what we did learn um, right before is that he was the former editor in chief of In Style magazine in Manhattan for many, many years. So, boy, do you have stories! <laughs> Thank you all for taking time to join us tonight. This is a really cool looking audience. And I will turn it over to Raina. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lisa. Can we all give Lisa a round of applause? And Tanisha, this has been an incredible week so far. So I would love everyone to give Tanisha her flowers and give her a round of applause because it is incredibly difficult to host a lot of different events in one week, and tomorrow is going to be amazing. Um, and give yourselves a round of applause for being here on a Friday night. And is there a Sunstein in the building? If we can just get a shout. <laughs> I, it's, it's, I'm so happy to see all of you and just, it's wonderful to, to have the privilege to be here to be in conversation with all of these incredible panelists here today. So let's get into it because I know you all have questions, but I certainly do. Um, what would you say, what's creativity to you? What does that mean as far as the industry? And you know, that's for anyone and everyone to answer if you'd like. How does that, how does fashion play a role in the creativity in your respective roles? Well, I, I, I think creativity is the ability to uh, problem solve in new and different ways or to look at things in, in new and different ways that haven't been done before. Um, whether that's, you know, fashion or art or writing or, you know, you're, you're solving a problem in a new and interesting way. That's awesome. I think for me, um, creativity is just being authentic. I think right now, especially in like the fashion and beauty and lifestyle space, especially with editorials, we're seeing like a lot of repetition and those really like standout things, happenings, places, events are like really when like a team is being authentic to themselves and sticking to like those brand guidelines and like what really like holds the brand up. So I think right now in like 2023, like creativity is all about being like yourself. That's great, I love that. Um, well, th first of all, thank you for having me and just being here. Um, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Like, uh, I think right now, for so many decades, people looked to fashion for like where creativity would be and what was happening and what was cool and what was trending. And I think um, it's a really interesting time to be interested in fashion or being in the fashion business because fashion kind of fell behind creativity. Um, and just sort of like what's happened to the world, like gender inclusivity and the weather and COVID and the fact that people don't want to wear fancy clothes in the same way. Like all of these things have pushed fashion back up against the wall. And I think the creativity will be in fashion will be the response to that, to sort of like own it and make it something new. I think you made an incredible point there because essentially what you're saying is that the spectrum has broadened completely. And essentially, especially Nandi, when you talked about being your authentic self, you're you're telling a story, right? Like you're you're speaking about your experiences and it's shining through your work. I mean, let's not, you know, I've done a little research and I have to congratulate you, Nandi, because you just finished and is soon to be publishing your um cover story for Essence Magazine, and you got to cover um, Monique Rodriguez, which is the CEO of Mile Organics. Yes, please, please congratulate her. Um, tell us about that experience for you. You know, How did you uh, show your creativity and tell your story through that experience? Yeah, I think, so yeah, she's on our cover. Um, it's on stands March 15th, and for me, um, I think, just, I don't want mean to sound repetitive, but just like being authentic within myself, like to tell the story. So it was about black women in our hair. So it's like, I know that story better than anyone because I'm a black woman and my hair is natural. It's in a braid right now, but I wear it natural. Um, and so I think for me, just telling the story was like really like detailing my experience and how I felt with my hair. And then like actually interviewing a hair founder who is one of the first black women to sign a major multi-million dollar deal with like a P&G company to buy into her brand. It was just like really, it was really cool. And to be able to do that and to be able to be granted that opportunity to write for a legacy like black publication that has been in so many like people of color's lives is like, you know, it's, I don't take it for granted. 
Absolutely, and it's an incredible accomplishment. So congratulations to you again. Thank and you. Um, you know, in this industry too, all of you can answer this, you have to keep up to date in the latest trends, right? Like there's all, things are always changing, whether it's going obsolete or whether things are coming back in time. I mean, go-go is coming back. The boots are, you know, it's the seventies, the retro is coming back in style again. Things never go away completely. Um, what do you all do in your respective fields to stay up to date or to stay current in your jobs? Well, for me, I I have three photo shoots every week, and I have to constantly, you know, part of my job is always to create newness, right, within the brand guidelines, right? But literally, I, you know, there's no one standing over me telling me what they'd like to see. It's all like, you know, what's new now next? So research, research, research. I mean, I go into holes of research and pulling inspiration and swipe that, you know, would bore you to tears. But that's really, I mean, and I think, too, it's like, if you get too um, wrapped up in the trends of everything, right, you sort of get a sense of the collective, what's going on in the collective, right? And that just sort of informs you from there. That's great. I feel like, you know, when you have like these big corporations, they hire like the young people to like keep them hip, you know? Um, and so like, I feel like I'm that for Essence. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm like all on TikTok and all of those things, which is where I get my inspiration from to come to my bosses and tell them like, hey, this is what we should be doing. So I feel like it's super smart to have like always have like fresh college grads or like interns or like people on your staff who like can keep you in the know. Like I graduated four years ago, so I'm hiring like girls who just got out of college, you know, like to keep me hip so I can keep my bosses hit. <laughs> um, in magazines, you know, it, it, there's, no, uh, there's no trend that just sort of happens. It's very um, contrived, um, and there's a whole process um, uh, around trends, and that's why, why you can do research, right? Like, they've already decided what the colors will be three or four years from now, and so I don't find any of that all that compelling, it's fun to see and it's fun to watch people and it's fun to you know try things on and see if trends work for you. But I think what's so cool about trends in fashion now is like the ability to use so many new ways to tell stories. Like I think what is really trending is less about the styles and more about the way people are showing themselves. Like you know the way in which TikTok can make a song from you know 15 years ago popular instantly is the same way it does it for fashion. And I think the smartest people in fashion are using the new storytelling to create trends that are way outside the industry's decision of what you'll be wearing, you know, in five years. And I feel like if you're really in the fashion industry, like you are anti-trend. Like that's how I feel. Like if you are really a fashion girl, you're anti-trend because if you see on TikTok, somebody that I love is like Aaliyah Kaur. Like, she's, like, this girl on TikTok who, like, wears these, like, fishnets and, like, moon boots. And, like, she's just, like, amazing. But, like, she created that lane. Like, wherever she goes, she's going to wear that and look like that. And so I feel like, to your point, like, after the pandemic and stuff, I just feel like all the trend talk is very, like, everyone's, like, what can I do that's not a trend? Like, if you go on Vogue, if you go on Allure, if you go on Cover Tour, that's what they're talking about now. Like, the trend is, like, just being cool, like, just being chill. I completely agree with you. I am a true person of going against the grain and just really showing who you are. I mean, I think if I'm typically not feeling my best self, I'm probably dressed up more just to make myself feel great. I don't know if any of you feel that way, but I, I, I completely agree with you. I think because um, we've pulled back a little bit, you know, for in New York, Fashion Week or what have you, it, it really forced us to think a little bit harder and to figure out, well, okay, so it, from a branding perspective, what is our why? What's the purpose behind what we're doing in this industry, whether it's working for a magazine or whether it's styling or whether it's um, photo shoots or editorial, what is the purpose behind what, what, what we're doing? So Ariel, when you were at InStyle, what was your why? What what did fashion make you do it there? Um, it's a, it's a question I ask myself all the time. Um, <laughs> I just briefly like got into magazines because I wanted to be in books. Uh, books was very slow. Magazines seemed fast uh, when I started in magazines, which is 
a joke because now magazines are so slow, they're dead. But um, so for me, magazines was a place to be uh, working in editing and writing. I ended up working in a men's fashion magazine. I then worked at InStyle. They brought me back as the editor. So um, what what challenged me about being there and, and trying to make high fashion accessible um, was the was like the trick every day, right? Like how do you make these things that these companies need you to participate in and want you to participate in, but at the same time, in order for you to feel like you want to participate in, they make it alluring and mysterious and uneasy to participate in. And so unlocking that for people was very exciting, which is why I now work in retail development where we're looking at stores and figuring out how do you bring together a community of stores that are um, both alluring and inviting. The amazing thing about the last five years, which throughout the hardship of the pandemic and now inflation, like you have so many people with access to images or creating images. And I think, um, I think it would be, I think it's really hard to be in magazines now because the world um, can create so quickly and so easily. So for me now, uh, when I look at fashion in, in Seaport where we're building our um, fashion brands, it's really about like, authentic storytelling and like can people really see themselves in this clothing can they elevate their mood can they feel empowered can they give back we have project poly nikki is here um she she has a store in seaport and like it's a brilliant concept where like everything is tied to really authentic causes right like um and it's not just cause washing it's like it's this is what the brand is about and so for me what's interesting now about fashion is like the way everybody has an individual approach. So cool. It was never like, you couldn't have magazines if everyone had an individual approach. It's the opposite idea, right? A fashion magazine. So um, that was a long answer, but that was, no, it was, it was 20 that years was of working. That was great. And it really shows just how the skills from uh, working at a magazine, several magazines actually, um, and writing can translate to any industry. I mean, it's it's collaboration, it's it's customer service. You know, it's there's a broad scope there, so there's no limit to what you all can and can't do. I mean, Evan, you are a part of teams almost every single day. How do you how do you do it? How do you streamline the process and make sure things are efficient on set? Well, I I don't know if anyone here watches Below Deck. I'm a huge Bravo. I mean, Bravo, that's all I watch. Literally all I watch. So, yeah. So I like to think of myself as the captain, right? Which is like, you know, I have to lead them, um, but I also have to remain open and collaborative for it to be successful in my eyes. Um, because planning is a big thing. And as a creative, planning does not, for my creativity, does not really come naturally to me. It actually feels like the opposite of it, you know, if I have to plan ahead, like how do I want the lighting to be, and like what what kind of set do I want to do, or location for this? You delegate look. those things to other people. No, it's me. Oh my so God. I had to get good at it, you know, because I think where I sh where I've always um, felt strength is in the moment. I always, I never second guess myself. I always know what to do, and it never feels like the wrong thing. Where I struggled was planning, and it is still not what I love, but I found that planning made me a better creative. I still never marry anything, you know, because I think once you marry something and you're like, it has to be like this, the creativity is really dead because it doesn't always work out. Most times it doesn't work out like that. And you're also closing yourself off to new and exciting possibilities in the moment. So I plan, um, which my team really appreciates. Um, so they're not, you know, trekking all over the place, you know, on a whim. Um, but then I also... You know, I'm also staying open to things that are not working. If the lighting's not working or the space isn't working like I thought it would, you know, and other people, what they might be thinking in the time when it, you know, if it's the stylist and it, you know, they're thinking about the clothing and they have an idea. So I'm always constantly open to it. Um, but I've created sort of a pathway for us and it seems to work well. What has been your most challenging experience so far? Like, what has been like, how did you bring it back? How did things go crazy? And then you, uh, let's wheel it back in and make sure we execute. I would say positivity, um, while also assertiveness in the fact that I have to lead everybody, right? So I might be freaking out in my mind, and they might see a little shuffle here and there, but ultimately I'm going to now redirect us, and they, you know, they follow in tow, and so... We just we kind of go through it together and I think that it's it's all about collaboration. I 
love that. Yeah. And a lot of confidence, really. And Or at least faking it for the moment, right? And then Make once we get the shot, it. I'm like, yeah, that's it. I got it. I knew it. You know, so it's it's a lot of like faking it in the moment and then be like, okay, it's here. It's here. You know, and then they respond to that. So That's so awesome. And um, what do you guys think? people who are just getting in the game, like what do they need to succeed? Do they need a certain type of education? What has been your background or experience to be in the fields that you're in? I think for me, I feel like my advice is gonna be a little different, but I always tell this to students and everybody like, be cool. Like, <laughs> that's it. Like. I feel like we can psych ourselves up a lot when we're like applying for jobs or going into interviews or like for me, like interviewing celebrities or like whatever the case may be. And like, you just have to be confident and be cool. Don't be awkward. Don't be weird. Like just, just be cool and be natural. Shake off, shake everything off, go into every situation like that. And like, I feel like you will be successful. It's like everybody's situation is different based off age based off nationality based off gender so like everybody can give you different advice that pertains to who they are and like their identity but like I feel like a universal thing is like being cool and like shaking it off and not being discouraged by no because you're going to hear a lot of no's before you hear yeses and I just think like if you just have that confidence like every interview you're going to do fine if you walk out and you don't get it you're still like i killed that interview so like they lost me you know so <laughs> yeah that's my advice uh one thing i wish i knew i love that too like yes. that's amazing <laughs> um yeah they lost you and you'll go somewhere else Deal with it yeah um <laughs> I, uh, it took me a really long time, and I think this is really true in fashion and probably in the creative arts, in retail, um, it took me a long time to realize that many of the people that are, not the, the four of us, but many of the people who are experts in this space are just folks who are really passionate about it and have put in the hours there's no like magic to being an expert. And I think when you're young or you're new in a field, especially in one that is meant to be intimidating in some ways, is meant to be exclusionary in some ways, um, it's really easy to get psyched out uh, and to not, and to imagine that these folks who like are so big um, or seemingly so big, like have this you know, knowledge or expertise. And it's not to say the industry doesn't have expertise, but if you just decide that you're going to step forward and be one of those people, you will succeed in the creative arts to the extent that you are willing to put yourself out there. And I think it took a long time for me to realize because I, like I said, I came into fashion magazines and, and real estate development kind of like through the side door. And so I was always like learning what everyone else knew and was putting it together for people. And you learn quickly that, Everyone is always learning. So I just think, like, don't get yourself freaked out um, when you think, oh, my God, I have so much to learn. You don't. It, it, you learn it in the passion. That's great. And I would just say, too, is to, you know, there's a fine line between confidence and arrogance, right? And I think anyone that starts, and if you mistake that, then you can really shoot yourself in the foot with opportunities. Um, and it's also about, like, showing up to a space and just being a sponge, Right. And being a sponge and learning doesn't show that you're not confident. It actually shows that you're more confident in it. And we were talking about this earlier, but, you know, I, I really think that curiosity is the driver of creativity. And if you keep if you remain curious and you remain sort of open and constantly learning and not into like, oh, I know, I know, you know, that that space, then that's that's really helpful. One thing I've learned about being young and coming to the space is like just always give your bosses the utmost respect, like always like because I'm young and I feel like I have to struggle with respect because a lot of people that report to me are older than me but I every place that I've gone in like my boss I hold them to like the highest pedestal like I always tell them like how can I learn from you like what can I do to be like be like you and you know like people like when you stroke their ego a little bit you know like whether they want to admit it or not but like to your point like you have to be humble to a, a to to a 
to to a point, but then you have to be confident enough to to know that you can do it and you can succeed and excel. But like, I feel like my generation sometimes we just feel like we can do it. We know how to do it all, and we don't show respect to like the people that are above us. But what I realize and how I've gotten so far so young is like I respect my bosses, and once I respect them, they're willing to like champion me. They're willing to like, you know tell like how I got my job at Essence is because I was right under my boss and she told me Essence was hiring like just because she liked me and because I met my deadlines so it's just very much like show respect to your bosses and you will get really really far I love that I think you've said a lot of amazing things about um you know being a sponge and just building rapport and allowing people to trust you and I, I believe that's wonderful just showing up just ready and eager to learn is awesome but i mean let's get a little bit controversial though let's get a little controversial and i think it's it's we should be a sponge i i show up everywhere just willing to understand and if i got it wrong then show me what i need to do better and i'm i'm going to do it the right way the next time um but i think that I feel like sometimes I'm in part of two different art scenes in Boston. So how can we make at least the city or the industry in general be more inclusive um, to creatives out there who are really trying their best? They're, they're working a day job. They're a makeup artist at night. Um, how can the stylists like the Esther Dorvilles get collaborations at Rue? Like how can, we, how can we bridge the gap? How can we get photographers like Marvin and Reggie in the scene at, at magazines like InStyle? How how do we um, extend that sort of grace to make sure that it's representative of everyone? I don't think the industry is inclusive at all, and I don't think it's going to change. That's just my personal opinion. Um, I think that the industry in 2020, we kind of saw like this like really big resurgence, but a lot of my peers were having conversations about how even at Fashion Week just now, like the models were diverse, but the front row wasn't. So I think, I really think the industry is a little bit elitist, but you have to know how to talk to people and you have to know how to network. But as far as the industry changing, I mean, I don't, I don't have that, that faith. We want to be controversial. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Like, I think that the industry has like the people that they want to see succeed. And then there's like the few people that kind of make it through those cracks because they know how to network and they know how to talk to people. But I do think that the industry has those certain standards and kind of blueprints in place for to make it easier for people to succeed. And you'll see those conversations throughout social media, throughout Twitter, throughout TikTok. You, like, you can just search New York Fashion Week and there's conversations about diversity. I think it's really like the people, that question, in my opinion, is for the people that are in charge right now. You know what I'm saying? Because, like, if you're, like, a boss, then you should be hiring Latino women. You should be hiring black women. You should be hiring queer people. You should be actively making sure that your staff is diverse. And so I feel like we can obviously say, like, this is what we want in hopes of the industry. But the question, that question is for the people that are in charge right now. Like, what are you doing to make sure that your staff is diverse? Like, if you look at your staff, you don't have a queer person, you don't have a black person, you don't have a Latino or an Asian, you're not doing your job. You know what I'm saying? And that's just facts, you know? That is real. That is very real. And we do need to clap to that. If there was a camera right here, I'd be like, come on, people at the top. It is time for a change. <laughs> But then, like, on the other hand, it's hard because some of those really creative people that are diverse don't even feel the confidence to apply for those jobs. So it's like I could like somebody could be looking at candidates and not even have a diverse reach of candidates because those those candidates that are diverse don't even feel the confidence to go out and apply for the job. You know what I'm saying? So it's like it's not even the boss's fault, because if you have a whole bunch of candidates that look the same. It's not your fault that you just have to pick one. You know what I'm saying? Right. You know, so yeah. And, I mean, to that point too, and you know, I talk about this. I mean, I, I realized this as a performer years ago. Is that what can instead of looking to the business to change, right? For you to feel sort of comfortable to move forward, it's what can you control, right? So you can control yourself. You can control where you apply, how you apply, how you put yourself forward, who you put yourself in front of. That's what you can control. And if you focus on those things, then you'll feel much less suffering, right? That things should have been different. Things should be a different way. It's like, that's always going to be there. But like, what can you do for yourself? 
That is so key. And, you know, especially in the legal industry as well, I think it, it doesn't matter where you work, um, finance, corporate, not corporate, there's always going to be these challenges. And I think what's incredible is um, knowing to get to yourself to a certain point so that you can prop doors open for other people. And a lot of, for me, my why is to be a change agent. I know that from the very beginning. I knew that, you know, it, it was always me to, to push the grain for something. And I knew that if I can do it or if somebody else can see me do it, um, then they can do it. I know that another young black woman or another uh, person of color can see themselves in these spaces and know that, that they will be able to succeed, you know? And it, it doesn't matter, you know, what the struggle is behind what you're doing, it's possible if you just stick it out a little bit, right? <laughs> and so if you were to go back in time to when you first started in your careers, what would you have wished um, someone of a mentor or someone that uh, would have told you at that time to have prepared you for success now? Anyone can answer this. I think I had really good mentors. Like, I I started at BET, you know, so it's like I started at a black publication. Then I went to Cover Tour, which is like high fashion, anti-Vogue, anti-Condé Nast. So it was like I really got like that, like, kind of like cool, grungy fashion experience, like going on the subway, doing returns out throughout the day like I was in the nitty gritty going to get avocados for my boss doing returns at Prada Gucci coming back oh, yeah. like I was doing that and then I got put to Essence but at Cover Tour I had at Cover Tour the woman in charge she was a black woman her name was Leah Faye Cooper and I remember she just like took me under her wing like she was just like this industry is crazy and I'm gonna make sure you get a job like before you before you leave here and in 10 months she's like it, I was supposed to have the in, it was a fellowship I was supposed to have it for three months and, and ended up extending to 10 months and the last month she like came over and tapped in my like shoulder she's like Essence is hiring and I was like oh cool and she just like kind of pushed me through so I feel like I got I got lucky in having really good advice in the beginning because just like black women like right. you know what I'm saying like they just kind of like come and grab you and hug you so yeah <laughs> auntie auntie put you through. for for sure for sure um I, I think for me one of the things that uh it took me a long time to realize from mentors was um that they have uh, somebody ahead of you a boss a mentor has a much better view of everything that's happening and that includes seeing skills that you may not know you have or may not even want to tap into um, and being allowed, uh, you know, being told, yes, you can try this, but maybe no, do that. That is a very hard thing to hear. But folks who are in mentor positions have much more information than you. And they have much more information about what the industry needs at the moment, what the company may need, what the market needs. And they also can see you in different ways. And so it took me a little bit of time to say, OK, well, I'll consider that someone can see something else in me. Um, because especially in fashion and in, in retail and in everything style, like you want to be so independent and individual and unique, and you don't want anyone to say you don't have it or you can't have it. Um, but it's different. It's different when a mentor says, you know what, you know, you love fashion, go to law school. Right. Because every fashion designer and every house and every accessories brand needs great IP, right? Like, the, uh, you know, someone said to me, you want to be in books, you really want to be in magazines. Magazines aren't interesting. You actually really want to be in retail. So that was always other people saying those things to me. And I think, you know, getting used to knowing that you should listen to that is, is hard. Absolutely. I would say for me, um, if I could go back or to say to anyone is, you know, it's being fearless and then also not getting caught up in the, you know, this should have happened this way or this should have happened on this timeline, right? Because everything is as it should be right? Because that's what's happening. So again, that's like thinking about the right stuff and just, just going for, for it. You know, you go for it and then you adjust. You go for it, you adjust, you know, and not getting bogged down with, um, you know, it, it's a hard thing, right? You, you want to listen to people, but then you also want to listen to yourself. And I think finding that balance is, is really key. I would, can I say something Absolutely, too? Absolutely, yes. I was going to also say that, okay, I, you know, earlier I said, respect your boss. I said that right. Okay, uh -oh. respect your boss. Uh oh. But like, 
I wish I, what I wish somebody I would have learned is like if your boss is being like rude to you or like if chief, chief of staffs are saying something like don't get worked up don't let that ruin your day mm-hmm. like I really wish somebody would have told me that earlier like if somebody has an attitude at the job don't let that ruin your day don't let that like ruin how you feel about the job because when I was EIC I got my editor-in-chief position at 25 like I didn't know what I was doing. I was just ambitious. That's why I got the job. Like she told me you were ambitious. Like you just wanted wanted to do it. And I molded into being an editor in chief. But there were so many times where something would happen and I would just let that ruin my whole day or like let that ruin my vibe. And then maybe I wouldn't be the nicest to my staff. or I wouldn't be the nicest to just anyone that day. And so I wish somebody would have told me like, what happens at work does not dictate your life. You are not your position. Like you have a life outside of that. Um, yeah. That's really powerful, really. And I think we all needed to hear that just because you, you just you just never know sort of how the day is going to go. I mean, I was a prosecutor for three years and everyone that was higher than me made me pee on myself a little bit. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> anyway, um, and it still happens now. <laughs> and I think what's important is that you just, you want to see what makes them great. At one point, they had no idea what they were doing either, but there was someone above them. There was someone that saw something in them that said, you have this spark. I don't know if you see it in yourself, but I'm going to make sure we get you there. I'm going to make sure that you understand who you are. And I think that's incredible because we can be in any kind of space and just not know how powerful we are in that moment. And yeah, it's like a, this is a fast paced industry like you can get really worked up stressed anxiety deal deal with a lot of mental health issues because of how fast paced this industry is which is why I try to just stay real cool because it's like you know it's a lot it's a lot you know so you just gotta like really know every day you step into it like I'm going into my job at at six (laughs) at six don't call me you know don't text me Boundaries. (laughs) boundaries and I'm learning that too but it's like just I feel like just don't get caught up in all of this you know be smarter than your situation I can sit here and talk to y'all this whole night but I do want to open up uh, the floor for any questions out here but before I do that I just want y'all to to say a little something about yourselves that are that's just that we wouldn't know like what's something that you know what's the scoop give us the tea what's something we wouldn't know from google Hmm. Um, What can I say? What can I say that? Yeah. Um, Well, I mean, for me, being an art director, you know, my my path there is not a path that I think in the creative field, right? There's not necessarily a path that you take like there is with other jobs. Like if you do A, B, C, and D and you ace it, you go to the next level and you get paid this amount of money. Right. So I started as a performer. Then I went to casting. Then I was a stylist. And now I'm an art director. So I think if you look at it holistically, it kind of makes sense. Um, but yeah, I've done, I've, I've been the talent, I've assessed the talent, and now I'm running the ship. <laughs> so you can break out in harmony with me right now. There you go. Oh, okay. Let's do it. <laughs> um, for me, something that you wouldn't know, like off of Google, I guess like my whole like aesthetic or like mission or vibe or whatever you want to call it. I just believe like I still want to be young and enjoy my life young, although I've been able to like reach great heights in my career. So like I like to go to the club, (laughs) like to pop 42 bottles, (laughs) but then I might like go to work and make my meeting at 7 a.m. Like I still want to enjoy my young life. Like I live in Houston. I moved from New York so that I could go to Houston and have fun with my friends because I dedicated 19 to 26 to New York and Chicago while all my friends I was just looking at them traveling and going places and things like that so I was just like I want to do that too so I think you know just something yeah you don't see on Google is I just like to turn up and (laughs) and I get my work done too so (laughs) balance it's balance Sorry. I also, it's unfair. I, don't, I have the age disadvantage. Like the older you are, the more there's on Google. Yes. So, yes. Um, and I had a very public job at one point. So, yes. Um, style uh, is like that's big too. Like. So, <laughs> yeah, and um, I think everything is on Google. But I think if you, what you what you wouldn't know maybe is like none of it was planned, and I think a lot of 
times when I'm uh, invited to be speaking or in a panel situation, it's because um, the career trajectory looks really smart. And I'm the first person to tell you, it's not on Google. Like, none of it was planned. And I think that should be a big relief to a lot of people, too, because it, not only was it not planned, it's not what I had planned. So I think, you know, that's, it looks like puzzle pieces in Google, but it's far from it. And, and that's that part of staying open, right? And not, and not thinking like, okay, it's got to be here in five years. It's got to be this. It's staying open and letting go with the flow, stay alert, listen, you know, listen to yourself, listen to others. Yeah. That's incredible. Well, thank you so much. I am going to give y'all a clap. And please, if there is anyone, um, maybe from one or two questions that we can get from anyone in the crowd. So I'm here to moderate the, first of all, Raina, amazing job. Give it up for Raina, amazing. Ethan, Nandy, Ariel, spectacular. I love everyone here. Tanisha, fantastic job. Um, okay, questions. Who has questions for these amazing people? Well, I'm gonna get you one anyway. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sam. Oh, this is weird. All right, y'all. Um, Hi, so I really enjoyed everybody's message on like authenticity, and I would just love to know in a field that kind of requires maybe some conformity on your end, how do you remain authentic to yourself in what you do? There's no conformity with me. Like, what you see is what you get. This is how I talk to my staff. I may be a little nicer to my boss because I like my salary. But, <laughs> yeah, this is like, it's... I, it's no faking it with me. Like, I feel like for me, I'm just like, this is how I am. Like in how I write, how I talk is how I write. Like I love exploring different things. And I think you have to be, to be great, like to be EIC of in style, you have to be yourself. Like you have to be authentic. Like you cannot be an imposter or you're not going to get the job that you want. You know what I'm saying? Or you're not going to succeed at the job that you want. I'll say that. Um, I, I think with conformity, it's such a, it's such a powerful word and it's such like, we all don't like it and you know, like no one wants to embrace it. And I think when it comes to conformity, like for me, the question, um, often is like, is it, or, or, is it that I or we are being asked to conform to something Ugh. or is it that it feels like conformity, but actually like it's a best practice, um, or someone much richer with many more resources has already decided in the research it shows, you know, like open a movie on a Tuesday, not on a Wednesday, right? Like, the, so if you allow yourself to sort of accept the things that might be best practices, you can then focus on the small things that are the conformity. The fun part about fashion and retail and styling and writing is like we we are at the forefront of being able to ask those questions and have an audience, right? Like, why were there two big fashion seasons every year, right? Like, nobody shops that way, and the climate isn't that way, right? Like, why, why were there no skirts on men's runways for 80 years? You know, so, um, and those are smaller conformity issues, but like, all, everyone in this room who has uh, creative outlet is able to ask those questions, but d but deciding, distilling, is it conformity or is it like this thing that we all agree actually works? And then oftentimes, you know, there's a piece of that that needs to be tweaked too. But like, I know it's really hard to be successful and to not conform to what people think is successful. Yeah, and I, and I think just to add on, I, I agree with, with both of that, is that you can, you know, you want to be workable too, right? You want to be able to adjust. So you can still be authentically yourself within parameters, right? You, you don't have to lose yourself in order to work well with others or to, you know, sometimes you, you have to accept things that you may not love, right? But that also makes you stronger, especially if you can power through that and still wind up on the other side because you're still staying authentically yourself. It goes back to like what I said, like just be cool. <laughs> like you know I'm so like not professional but like one of the things that my friends and I say is like peep game act lame and it's just like you peep it but I don't have to say anything you know what I'm saying like that's what me and my friends say peep game act lame like it might be like 
the craziest thing that you just think is like, okay, why would they do that? But I'm not going to say it because I like my job. So, <laughs> so I believe in stretching yourself, but I don't believe in assimilating. And a lot of it is about being grounded in who you are. You know, like for me, I'm a spiritual person. I'm a woman who is rooted in faith in God. I get it from my mama. She's back there. Hi, mom. Um, and it's really important because when challenges come, you need to know what where your source is or who your source is and, and what where you come from. Um, in my office, I have a three beautiful paintings that my dad sent to me when I got my job. And the first thing that he said is said, you know, focus on where you're going, but never forget where you come from. So when things get hard, I want you to turn around and look back at home. And there are three beautiful paintings from Haiti, like straight from the source. And so when things are challenging and you, you, you are going through a, a period of, I'm not used to this, this is nothing like me, it's okay. You're being stretched, but you don't have to, like everyone said here, uh, lose yourself in the process. You're gonna make it your own someday, it's just not the time right now. Right now is for you to learn and, and um, in, incorporate what has made other people successful so that when you become successful, I'm speaking that into existence, um, it will work for you and the next person and the next person and the next person. <laughs> Any other questions? Who else? Although, Raina, I do want to follow up on that because you have a really interesting journey. You're very creative, very fashion-minded. You know, for you to choose law school was not a uh, sort of given um, for you, right? Do you want to just go into oh, that? Oh, sure. I, so my mom's here, Lisa. <laughs> 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 okay, so I mean, I knew that I just wanted to help people, right? So, I mean, I grew up in a Haitian household of all the Caribbean people who are here know you have only three careers as doctor, lawyer, engineer. Okay, honey, there is nothing else. You tell your mom you're going to be a singer. She's going to be like, what is it? So, <laughs> I mean, I was always creative. I wanted to be at Hollywood. I think I was maybe three years old. And I told my parents, I saw the Disney Channel and I said, listen, guys, it's time. We need to do ballet, dance. I need to be on the TV. It's what's happening. And they were like, all right, um, we're going to be busy. Um, and so I always had this creative outlet, but I was always focused on my education. That was the root of everything. And there was nothing that brought my parents together other than me saying, I don't think I want to do law school anymore. And they were like, no, you have to. And I think what, what that did for me was just to have options and just knowing that I can also do this. I can also um, be a litigator. I, it's, it's theater, really. It's really storytelling. It's, it's, you know, talking to an audience and, and, um, you know, making sure that you're crossing every T and dotting every I. And that's what we do as creatives as well. It's perfecting your craft, you know, and, um, to even, you know, speak to your point as a singer, I had to, I sang a lot of Brian McKnight and Whitney Houston before I developed what kind of inflection I was gonna have for myself or what my style would be. So it's always about learning and perfecting your craft and your technique and just studying a whole lot, <laughs> a whole lot. Love it, love it, love it, love it. Okay, who else, who else? Ooh, let me come over there. Hi guys, first of all, thank you for all the advice you guys have given tonight, it's been amazing. Um, I really wanna touch base on the part where you said like a lot of people aren't confident to apply for those jobs that they see out there. Um, one thing that I'm asking is what advice can you give somebody to become confident in that position? It's not necessarily that they're not confident in their craft, they're not confident in knowing that they actually might be picked. Does that make sense? So like, what advice do you, do you give that person who's just like, I'm ready to give up honestly because I don't even see if I'm ever gonna get a chance, when in reality, it's just probably keep on trying, but like, how do they remain down and know that like, all right, I know I might get a lot of no's, but let's keep going, let's keep, let's keep applying, let's keep doing it, let's keep trying. Like, at what point do you keep going and then, or, or maybe even pivot, find something else to do? I, I think too, you can't wait for the feeling to act, right? The feeling comes after. The feeling comes from like doing it and something coming from it or learning from it, right? And that 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 builds the confidence. Um, you know, at some point too, I mean, you have to listen to yourself, but then also what are people kind of saying around you? Like what is the feedback, right? Because at some point, you know, if you are getting a lot of feedback in one direction, you do have to kind of look at 
what you're doing perhaps or or how you're doing it and adjust and that and that's just part of staying open right while also figuring out where you fit but um you know you're going to go through i think it's continuing forward despite the emotional state um uh, one of the things that I think is so um, scary about interviews or um, auditions or just even having your work reviewed is that the like the standard of practice around the evaluation is so limited and is is decades old and doesn't speak to most people <laughs> who are in are in the position of being evaluated, and so. What I always tell people that I met, that I mentor um, who are looking for jobs or opportunities, um, this is sort of like the conformity. It's like the system looks like this. You're going to show up, but we are going to identify and you're going to identify. Um, like I'm most confident presenting X in this way. It may be a video. It may be um, I need more time to respond, it may be, um, I'd love to come in and present. And so what I often encourage people, because this worked for me, because I, like interviews, I was very young when I started in magazines, not unlike Nandi, and um, I was like, these people seem so old and they don't speak my language and, um, and I and it was a problem. So I um, I would encourage anyone who's like going through the process to be able to uh, secure the interview, secure the evaluation, and in that conversation, be prepared to say, you answer the questions, of course, but be prepared to say, I would love to be able to send you a video. Or you mentioned this, um, can I send you a link? Um, you know what is your best way of presentation f that's detached from the structure of the evaluation? And always return to that. And There'll be people who'll be like, who does this person think they are? You know, like trying to change the process. I only evaluate like this because my boss makes me fill in a form, you know. But the person that sees that you paused and asked for uh, uh, an opening to present your best self in your best way, who gets that is the person you want to be working with. Um, and so I would try that and know that like you, if you take a little bit of the agency away from the interviewer and the evaluator by saying like, yeah, yeah, you're going to ask your questions, you're going to flip through this, um, but I'm also going to send you my video or I have a book or portfolio or, you know what, thank you for these questions. I prepared a statement. I have two mentees who prepared statements um, addressing the doubts they thought the person had about their candidacy. You know, so like wherever you go, someone says like, do you have any questions for me, right? Um, the question I always tell people to ask, and I'm not a career specialist, so like take this with a major grain of salt. These people got hired, but um, <laughs> is, is there anything about my candidacy that you have a question about? Because I'd love to address that specifically. And most interviewers are not prepared to say that. Um, Either they haven't thought about it or they don't want to reveal it or it may be controversial to have a conversation about it. And instead, prepare the statement. You know, like, I would imagine, you know, I'm sure when you walked in, it was like, I can imagine at my age, you're wondering, how could I possibly know what's right for Essence, right? But here's why I know. And here's what I know I need to learn, right? That, like, knocks the question out, you know? Don't give so much power to the, the evaluator. So that's... That's and, worked for them. And then what I would say is like, were you in my interview or something? Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, like to get to that interview process is hard, right? Like to even get somebody to like email you back, like to get to the interview process is hard. I'm like queen finesse. So like every time I apply for a job, I'm going to find the HR person and find the person who directly report, I'm going to directly report to and I'm going to email them. I'm going to tell them I apply for the job and like, that's pretty much how I've always gotten responses. I've never gotten a job based off a dry application, like never received any responses. And because I work in the industry, I know that my HR lady is swamped and doesn't go through any of that anyways. You know, like I know that for a fact now, like she may go through a couple, but she doesn't have time to go through 300 and 400 applications. And so I will always say like, 
applying for the job is half of it, but then also researching who you're going to be reporting to, researching like the people that you're working with is the other half. Because then once you start reaching out to them, like, hey, I apply for this job, may you kindly like pass it on to the person who um, is going to be reviewing my application. You have like a direct tie into like the company, like um, to what you were saying when I when I I first got the job at Essence, because if you guys know my story, I was at Essence. I left and I came back. Um, I brought like a PowerPoint, like I printed it out and like I was supposed to be interviewing for the fashion assistant role, but I was like, they don't know that. And there was a fashion editor role open. So I was just like, well, I'm gonna make this PowerPoint and whatever they pick, they just pick. And they just so happened to pick the fashion editor role. And I was like 22. So I was like, okay, let's go. Um, and so that like, I just made a PowerPoint, like went in really confident, printed it all out, sat it in front of the uh, chief content officer at Essence and was like, I know I can do this. Like, this is what I want. And just, it's like, you just do things like that to make, show people that you're like dedicated and ambitious. Like, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, yeah, put our both, our, our all three of our advice <laughs> together. <laughs> people are going to underestimate you. Let them. Let them underestimate you. I am... I, I can, no one would have ever told me that I would have started in the criminal field <laughs> and then to be working at such a wonderful law firm like Sunstein doing IP. What? Like, who does that? And I think it's just because of the, pa the passion of my worlds coming together, just the passion for wanting to fight for someone and on their behalf and then being able to do it for amazing brands, you know? Someone would have told me, like, how did you do that? How? There were people who did underestimate me. But, but because I had so many people in my corner, because I had people who saw something in me, they were able to foster that connection and bridge the gap between those two worlds. Find your person. Find your group of people um, who are going to celebrate you and foster your connection in the spaces that you're entering into. You will never be afraid of a no because it's really just not right now. And it could, it's not a denial, right? It could just be a delay. So it's okay. Let them underestimate you. Ethan, anything? Evan? Sorry. Um, Evan? Yeah, yeah, I think I think I mentioned this, but it's you know, I'm sure when you were in that interview, right, you're still going to feel nerves, right? There's, if you wait for that emotional state to feel calm, cool, and collected, like you're going to go in there and just kill it and you feel good about it, that you're never going to get there, right? You have to continue forward no matter what you're feeling, right? And that's where your, you know, pr preparation, your knowledge, your research is going to come in handy. It's it's so true. It, it, like it, it, The job interview or the process, like, is is not the beginning and the end. And I was the ripe old age of 29 when I became editor-in-chief of an, an earlier magazine. And I was like, I thought like, okay, I, got, I made it through the gauntlet. And the first meeting at Conde Nast um, uh, that I had with the editorial director, they brought in the CFO of the company. And we were like sitting and like talking for 10 minutes. And the CFO said, when is the editor arriving? Like. Like, this new hire is okay. already 10 minutes late. I'm like, hi, it's me. <laughs> um, and so, like, he that, you know, three months later joked, like, oh, my God, I can't believe they hired somebody. So, like, you knew it was like, you got the job, but, like, this is going to continue. Um, and, you know, I, again, it's like, take as much power back. I just want to say one other thing about hiring and interviews and the process and opportunities is that um, if you're in the room and you're making those decisions, like to really be thinking about the rubric that like your company or world makes you fill out and like scraping off all the stuff that is conformity, you know, and like, and being willing to hire somebody that doesn't maybe, um, look the part on paper because everything has led to this point. Um, and I, as a person who's hired many, many people, I just also want to tell you, the system has gotten worse and worse. Um, it has gotten lazier and lazier in terms of the way in which candidates are presented to people. Yeah. So just like for, for instance, if you're, if you're hiring on LinkedIn, 
which I'm not right now, but I've been through this process. And when you're hiring on LinkedIn, LinkedIn's job is to keep you there as often as possible, right? And so they're, they're not happy with you just looking at candidates that are coming through your job posts. Like, that's too small a pipeline. They're pushing so many more people. You might be interested in this person. This person looked at your profile. This person looked at a job like this. And so I, I say this not to be daunting, but to, the system is so... Um, immeasurably broken that the advice that the panelists have given about like picking your thing, being confident, moving through, finding the human and finding the human's human and the human around that is so critical because otherwise you, you are really up an, uh, against like a, 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 a you know, numbers game because they don't care that you didn't get the job or I can't find a candidate. They just want me on the site looking more and more. And that's, that's its own business. <laughs> and I, we love LinkedIn, but like that, that, it's not just LinkedIn. This is, you know, these are all these boards. So it's just like, you know, when you go home and you're like, oh, like just know that the, like the, the algorithms are not in our favor. They never were and they really aren't now. So personal, personal, personal confidence. And like for this industry, you have to be outside. That's how I feel. Like my bosses send me outside. They're in the house, but they send me outside like here. <laughs> but it's like they like you this industry LinkedIn is not your best friend it's going to a fashion event and walking up to the editor-in-chief of Vanessa DeLuca a Anna Wintour a Lindsay People Wagner and saying is there any opportunities to work for you like that's how I've gotten my jobs that's how a lot of my friends have gotten their jobs that's why I moved to New York you guys are in Boston's not that far like it's just so many different these are like the meccas that you should be in and like network and put yourself out there rather than like hiding behind, not hiding, but being behind a computer screen. You know what I'm saying? Like you got to go out there. Like for me, for my job right now, I'm, you know, we interview a lot of celebrities and you have that celebrity has to trust you to give you a good interview. And I always tell this story, long, short story. I, like two years ago, I got flown to go interview Cardi B and Offset, like in their home, like eating crab legs with culture. <laughs> and, and the reason why how I did it was because I literally saw Cardi B at a club in Houston and I saw her publicist and I went up to her publicist and I was like, I work for Essence. They're like, oh, come take a shot with us. I was like, OK, and took a shot with them. And six months later, I got flown to their house to do a big interview with Offset. So be cool. But also <laughs> go outside and like network and don't be afraid to like just go up to somebody and be like, what's up? You know? Yeah, you can you can act fearless while still feeling the natural fear. Yes, yes. Like you know? feeling it yeah. inside. You feel it inside, but you just <laughs> act as if it's not happening. Or you, you, you recognize it, but you yeah. still continue forward. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.